All right, welcome everyone to our webinar on increasing digital and financial literacy today uh, with Jesse, who is joining us again for uh, the second session with him and the third session with Connected Canadians um, to talk about how you can strengthen uh, your skills and your knowledge around literacy, around protecting yourself financially uh, and technologically. We're very happy to have Jesse Smith with us. We also have Janice on screen, who is going to be our uh, moderator in the chat box, sharing some relevant links about Connected Canadians, uh, workshops, websites, and to answer any question you may have about Connected Canadians. Um, Rayan is manning the uh, <laughs> the tech today and changing the slides. And before we go any further in our presentation, um, I wanted to uh, welcome you and do a land acknowledgement. Uh, we're obviously all gathering from different places today, but we're acknowledging together that we gather on the traditional territory of a number of First Nations, and we acknowledge their stewardship of this land throughout the ages and to this day. And uh, we seek a new relationship with the original peoples of this land and hopefully one that is based in honor and deep respect. A couple of tech reminders before we get going. Um, to preserve the quality of this recording, your microphones have all been muted. So if you wish to communicate with us or with each other, please use the chat box to post your comments during the session or the Q&A box, which you can access at the bottom of your screen, um, where you can type your questions. So if they are general, simple questions, they will be answered in writing throughout the session. If they are bigger questions uh, for Jesse, they will be handled at the end. We'll take about 10 to 15 minutes to um, answer the readout questions. Uh, we also today have uh, two ASL interpreters with us. Uh, they are pinned, so you should be able to uh, pick the option to see them, and they will be taking turns throughout the session today to do the interpretation. Um, in terms of seeing all of us or the, or the person speaking at any given time or signing at any given time, you have the option to change the speaker gallery view. So you can choose you know, individual speaker view or gallery view. It's a little grid at the top right corner of your screen, so choose the layout that um, suits you best. And we have enabled closed captioning as well. So if you wish to have access to this, you can do this by clicking on it, I believe, at the bottom of your screen as well. Next slide. Um, a warning, we are, as always, um, you know, carrying evaluation on our webinars and we welcome your feedback on everything we do. So um, at the end of this session, you will have a pop-up notice on your screen that will take you to your survey link. We highly encourage you to take it. That helps us you know, improve from webinar to webinar. And um, a reminder, this session is recorded. So if you arrive a little bit late or have to leave a bit early or miss a part, don't worry, you'll be able to catch the recording on both EAPO's website and CNPA's website in the following, well, next week, start of next week. Um, and then during the presentation, anything that we're talking about, any document or links or website will be linked to in the chat box as well. So you can um, follow along that way. A quick reminder, whether using the chat or the Q&A, um, we are asking you to stick to general questions. Do not share any private details about your personal circumstances or personal accounts. We want to make sure that we pr protect your privacy and your confidentiality. And since this is a public event and is re being recorded and will be shared widely, we want to make sure that nothing gets out there that is all yours. If you want to um, discuss specific circumstances with someone, you can contact EAPO. They have um, um, advisors there that will follow up with you to arrange a private confidential conversation. All right, so speaking about EAPO, I'm gonna let Rayanne speak for just a moment about her own organization. Great, thanks Benedict. Uh, I just wanted to, for those who haven't joined us before, I just wanted to just give a, just a brief highlight about Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario. Uh, our mission really is uh, working towards making sure seniors are free from abuse, uh, have, a, have a strong voice and feel safe and respected uh, across Ontario, but even beyond those borders. Um, we were, our mandate is to implement Ontario's strategy to combat elder abuse, and we've been doing that since 2003. 
And that strategy is funded under the Ministry for Seniors and Accessibility. Um, and we provide uh, guidance, they provide guidance and uh, direction for that strategy each year. And for those who don't know CNPA, we're the Canadian Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse. So we are the only network that is pan-Canadian at this point, and we work to improve awareness, support, and capacity to help develop and strengthen a national coordinated approach to elder abuse and neglect. Um, so um, we do a lot of work around knowledge mobilization, collaborations like the one today, policy reform and education. And uh, we're always very happy to be seeing all of you for these uh, free webinars. And today with us, uh, we have Jesse Smith. So if you uh, were present for our last webinar with uh, Connected Canadians a couple of weeks ago, you've already heard Jesse speak. Uh, he is an educator and a hospitality professional with 20 years of client-facing experience with a very, very uh, actually exciting uh, and different background, uh, which includes a PhD in theology, which I really have questions about this, but that will be for another time. And he's also served as a minister, he's currently on the governing board of the Canadian Council of Churches, and is a, a, a volunteer for um, Connected Canadians. He's the accessibility and dementia lead there, as well as a technology mentor and instructor. And today he's gonna to tell us more about financial and digital literacy. I believe this is it for all the bells, whistles and other housekeeping matters. So um, I will let Jesse take over and start his presentation. Thank you so much, I appreciate that. And hello to everyone. Um, I am, in fact, Jesse, and the organization that I represent, Connected Canadians, uh, aims to foster digital literacy skills for seniors across the country. And that's done in a variety of ways, and one of those is through the provision of workshops like we have today. If any of the things that I'm speaking about are things that you want to take a deeper dive on, one of the other services that we offer is uh, a one-on-one -on -one mentoring session. So we have hundreds of volunteers across the country that are able to address individual needs that you might have. And so that um, that's something that if you have more questions about, you can reach out to us by either visiting the website uh, that was just listed in chat or calling us at the toll-free number there. We are as an organization based in Ottawa, but uh, have volunteers that are uh, from coast to coast and often will even be able to help people remotely. So wherever you are, we are happy to help. Now, what I will be doing is going through a, a series of slides. I'll be sharing my screen. <clears throat> and as we go, as was mentioned earlier, if you have any questions, you can put those in the Q&A box and there will be a time to discuss at the end. A thing to note as we go through this, as we're talking about online financial literacy and the sorts of things that you can do um, online, um, we're going to be using TD, so Toronto Dominion Bank, as an example of some of the things that you can do online with your finances, but don't feel limited. All of the actions that are going to be using TD as an example here can be performed through any major financial institution. So that means any of the big, big five or big six banks, depending on how you count, uh, as well as through credit unions from coast to coast. So um, I just said something about who we are. This is the same website and phone number. Uh, uh, one thing just to, to say here that I didn't say already about why we do this, I think and we believe that using technology actually is something that has a purpose. So you don't want to learn about computers for computer's sakes. It's to enhance your quality of life, to engage with your loved ones, and to connect to a broader part of the world. So that's why we do this. Um, and the workshops that we have here um, sometimes extend to other programs like lending out devices or working with an entire organization to, um, to offer this kind of tech 
support and, and mentorship. So maybe you yourself here as a participant, um, you don't, you're, you're not just a senior yourself. Perhaps you work in a care home and you want to get this information to pass on to people you work with. That's the sort of thing that we also like to do. So feel free to reach out to us if there's anything um, that you think we can help you with. So um, to frame what we'll be talking about today, I'm going to be taking you through some of the things that you can do, some of the ways that online banking can replace or enhance your current physical experience of using the bank, or maybe the way you use telephone banking. And after we go through a list of things that you can do with banking online, so the way you can control your finances, we're also going to talk about ways that you should stay safe or, or tips to um, tips that respect the kind of sensitivity behind your financial information. So that, that will be the sort of two moves that we make. First of all, things you can do in your online financial life in terms of banking. And then secondly, what you should be doing to stay safe once you start doing this uh, kind of thing. Now, any online uh, financial service is something that big banks make it easy for you to sign up. So while I know that uh, in some cases, credit unions require you to go into a branch, uh, for the big six banks, the last time I checked, you're actually able to sign up for online banking at home as long as you have a bank card with you. And so registering is something that can be done. So um, Scotiabank lets you do this, TD lets you do this. And there's just a, a simple link that, uh, that, that guides you through this. And one thing, just to, I'm going to ask my colleague right now to stick this in the chat. You'll see me a few times through this presentation say, you know, like refer to the guide, refer to the guide. Well, there is actually a guide that we have uh, on the Connected Canadians website that, um, Janice, if you could just put that link up to the online banking um, little modules, that would be great. And that's something that can show you not only how uh, online you can use things through TD, but also it will link to all the other bank platforms uh, to help you get started in terms of banking online. And there's a lot that you can do when you're online to, to control your finances in a way that's not just observing. Uh, I know that some of the earliest attempts to put banking information online, it was just sort of like, it was like replacing your passbook at an ATM where you could maybe get a balance update or reprint your statement, but you couldn't do that much. And those days are, are long gone because now you can not only view your account balances or transactions, you can take active steps like transferring money between your accounts. You can pay your bills online. You can send money to other people. Uh, usually that's sending money to other people within Canada, but there are even ways you can do that for people outside of Canada. And you could order checks, set up direct deposit or request new accounts or products. So all of this can be done from the comfort of your own home. And when I look outside right day or right now at, at the day I'm having, and it's this, it's a uh, very unpleasant, wet, heavy snow. The roads are incredibly treacherous. This is the kind of day where I would love to be able to save myself a trip to the bank. Uh, the sidewalks are terrible. The roads are bad. And so you get to do some of that stuff uh, from the comfort of your own home. So when you're banking online, one of the first things that you sort of think about is that you can check and see what the status is. You can view your account balances. That's something that can be done uh, for not only your checking account or savings account, but for other financial products or other types of accounts that you have. So I know that I myself have access to not only my savings account and checking account, but I can get updates on the RESP 
I have set up for my children. I ha can get information on the line of credit that I have. Uh, and it, I happen to have a credit card and it's through TD. So I can look at that all in one place. Documentation about that is easy to access as well. And because you can access that documentation quite easily, one of the things I find is useful about being able to do this stuff online is that you can get rid of a lot of the paper that you keep around your house. See, when I am using any of the, the major banking platforms, I can view my transactions. So viewing transactions is not just like for the last 30 days, the last six months. Uh, usually you can go up to, uh, in the case of TD, 18 months, but for some banks, it's even 24 months. So you can look at uh, a year and a half to two years worth of transactions. And one of the nice things about that is that you don't need to keep a year and a half to two years worth of your bank statements around in like a that one file box that you have. If you're looking to downsize and declutter some things in your home, that's actually a great thing to be able to let the digital copy stand. So a really useful thing there. And some types of financial products don't have daily or weekly activity. And so that would be something like maybe your TFSA, or uh, in my case, this, this is actually how I would check on statements for my RESP. So the registered education savings plan that I have for my children. Those kinds of statements are also available. And uh, in terms of those preferences, what you see here is an example showing that you can change how those things get delivered to you. So if you want to go paperless and you want them to not mail you things, you can set that up here. If by chance there are there is a particular statement that you do want to receive paper copies of, and maybe you're not right now, you can also change those delivery preferences when you start looking at statements and documents. Now, those things still just feel like observing, sort of checking in and seeing what's going on. When you think about starting to do stuff, one of the first things you might want to do is transfer money between accounts. And to do a transfer, again, using similar steps for any of the big six banks, you just need to select transfers and then change or determine which account you want that to go from or to. And when you're moving money between accounts like this, one of the things that can be useful is that um, those types of transfers online like this generally don't accrue fees. And sometimes the way that different bank accounts are structured, there might be fees um, for, for one account, not another. What do I mean by that? Well, imagine that uh, you want to send money to one of your grandchildren and that money you have in a savings account right now. But the checking account you have has this special feature where when you do an e-transfer, hint, we'll talk about that later, uh, you want to do an e-transfer and you can send it for free from your checking account. But if you try to send it directly from your savings account, they might you know, charge you two or three dollars, something like that, just because of the, the administrative way those accounts are set up. Uh, by quickly switching the money from your savings account into your checking account, which I might add happens instantaneously, you can then do the e-transfer from the account that doesn't have a charge for it. That's not a hypothetical. That, that's an example pulled directly from my life. And I, I know this because one time I did send an e-transfer direct from my savings account and I did spend $2 for that. And look, it's $2. I, it was fine. But I realized, oh, I just by doing this one other step, transfer it from A to B and then send money from B. Boom. Bob's your uncle. And that was how uh, I sort of learned why these transferring, uh, why these account transfers are useful. Now, beyond dealing with your money and keeping it sort of in, in check internally, uh, moving money from one account to the other, checking on the status, one of the first things that people begin realizing they can do online is paying bills. Now, anytime that you want to pay a bill to some sort of service provider, you do need to enter the payee to specify the organization that you're paying and your account information. 
So if you have a bill with, you know, Hydro One or uh, Bell Mobility, those sorts of things would require you to have like your account information. So you'd have your account number and the name of the organization. And sometimes it's true that multiple organizations appear with similar names. So maybe it's Bell Commercial and Bell Residential Mobility, something like that. Uh, just you want to make sure that you're getting the right organization. And um, whenever you go to select that, there would actually be a, um, th there's, there's a, <clears throat> oh, just one moment. Um, it, I just want to check with one of the other people watching right now. Uh, the thing that I'm talking about is, does anyone else have problems with my video feed at the moment? Can we see? Uh, no, we can see paying is, bills. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Just want to make sure there wasn't a problem with the, the screen and what you were getting. So as long as you know who the payee is, and that should be the name of the organization and your account, you can add a payee quite easily. Now, this is admittedly for paying Canadian bills. So if you have, uh, gosh, you, you've got to pay the utilities on a timeshare in Arizona. I don't know, something like that that's out of country. Uh, there, there might not be the same sort of easy steps you can take. And you'd probably, if you're doing that already, I suspect you'd have a U.S. bank account. Um, but that, that's a sort of separate, more complex thing we're talking about in Canada right now. And uh, once you choose add payee in whichever financial platform you use, you can do one of two things. You can set uh, up a recurring payment or you can pay the bill immediately. Now, why would you do this? It very well could be that you have a gas bill that's always due on the 17th and the payment is always between $95 and hundred. If you create a recurring payment for the 17th every month, uh, you can just save that mental step by having this automated. Now, a lot of you are probably familiar with this kind of thing uh, in the form of pre-authorized payments or auto debits, something like that. And it's true that a lot of major institutions or large corporations have a setup on their side to allow for pre-authorized payments. And that could be for something like your rent or your phone bill. But it's also true that many smaller service providers don't have this sort of feature themselves. So pre-authorized payments are something that is set up by the, <clears throat> let's say the, the business, it's by the service itself. Whereas automated bill payments are something that you set up. And so this is, this is uh, an additional sort of feature of online banking, the fact that you can control those automatic payments by setting up a recurring payment. And once you decide that you want to do that, here in this case, it was for an Enbridge bill, you would select the person that you want to pay. You would then choose the payment details. So what account you want the money to come out of, how frequently you want it to come out, and that would be either once or in a recurring a recurring cycle. And then you just need to verify that all the information is correct. And then you're done. So something like that is as easy as it can be to pay a bill. And again, that saves you walking down, like saves you going to the bank. It saves you going to the post office, wherever you might be paying those bills otherwise, and allows you to, um, to have those, that payment recognized instantly as well. Now that's moving money to organizations or institutions. That's what bills are. What about transferring money to other people? Well, one of the great things in Canada is that we're able to send money to other Canadians or people with other uh, Canadian bank accounts for free. And that's because of the Interact Network. So that word may or may not be familiar to you, or it's almost certainly familiar, but you might understand it or not understand it. So Interact is a money transfer uh, organization that's really, it's like a nonprofit that was set up by all of Canada's banks, the big five, the credit unions. So it's this surprising example of cooperation uh, to facilitate the easy transfer of funds.
And one of the reasons why this only is a thing in Canada is because there's no equivalent to the Interact Network in the United States. And so usually when you're talking about people sending money in the US, they, they can't rely on some one uh, thing like Interact as a service from banks and instead use third-party applications. You might have heard uh, terms like Venmo. Uh, in the States, that's actually like, it's become a verb. So, hey, Venmo me some money is just a thing uh, because they need this third party to do it. Whereas in Canada, Interact allows you to um, exchange money in between different Canadian bank accounts. And Interact does other things as well. If you have ever tried to log on to government services, you may have noticed that you can actually use your banking credentials to access federal programs. And that's something that is also facilitated by Interact. So it, it's sort of this, it's this generally benign good guy in the background pulling strings and making, making things work smoothly. And so an Interact e-transfer is how you send money to another person. And in general, it is free for checking accounts at every major uh, bank. That, again, is not true for some other kinds of accounts. So if you're sending money from a line of credit, if you're sending money from a savings account, it might not be free. But checking account e-transfers are generally free. And all you need to do when you want to send money to someone is, first of all, sign up yourself. And one of the reasons you need to sign up yourself is because there needs to be an email address attached. So they want to make sure they have the right one. You then add the person that you want to send money to as a contact, and you can send money to another person either by email or with a cell phone number. So that's one thing that's a little different. So you yourself, when you sign up, you need to give an email, but when you send it to people, either an email or a phone number is what you need. And then you just use uh, the banking platform to send money to a contact. So, this is what that looks like using TD as an example again. So you would register by putting in an email address and you can see you have the option of a mobile number, but it's not necessary. The reason why you have that email address there is because after you send an e-transfer, you will get an email uh, confirmation when that other person deposits their money. So they need to have that to sort of verify that the transaction was completed on the other side. So you create that with your email account and then you add a contact. And then, like I said, you can send it by email or text. You always wanna make sure that you enter the email address or phone number exactly and check that it's correct. Because if you get the number wrong, whoever has that wrong number, like imagine instead of calling someone saying, hi, is this Sue? No, I'm sorry, you have the wrong number. It's that, but instead of saying, hi, is this Sue, you're sending them $100. Some people might be a little motivated to be like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, I'm totally Sue. Absolutely, I'm Sue today. Because if they can figure that out, they get $100. <clears throat> so how in the world does the Interact E-Network prevent that? You know what? <clears throat> Security questions. A security question is something that your contact will have to answer correctly to deposit the money that you're sending. So you wanna make sure that you enter the answer the way that you think the person will answer. So if it's a name, you capitalize the first letters or the first and last name, so it's case sensitive. Uh, if you can send a separate text or email to the person to tell them what the answer is, but don't put that answer in the message. See, cause if you, that's sort of like giving someone a test with the answer box right underneath. You know, it's not really a test at that point. The message box is more for things like reminding them why you're sending money. For example, this is from our lunch out. Thanks for covering me. And one thing to note, and even if you're someone that's a pro that already sends e-transfers, here's the thing that you might not be aware of. Security questions actually need to be secure. And what I mean by that is, there was a, a, imagine that my security question was, um, what's the first day of the week that starts with the letter M? 
you think about that, and you're like, well, that's that's not even a question. It's Monday, obviously, 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 exactly. So the thing with obvious questions like that is that they're not secure. And there have been a couple instances of people in Canada who have sent an e-transfer and they sent it to the wrong person. But then not only did they send it to the wrong person, they also made a security question that was like, you know, what's the NHL team in Vancouver? And I mean, even if you're not a hockey fan, a brief Google can tell you it's the Canucks. And that like, that's not a secure question. And so there were people who made questions like that that were so insecure that the courts actually decided, eh, this is actually the person's fault, not the bank's. So they don't need to, like, it wasn't fraud. They don't need to try to get that money back. So just a, a case of sort of buyer beware. Um, this would be like learning for the first time that anytime you send money to someone, like you don't send cash in the mail, you only send checks. That That's one of those things that you just get taught like, because there's a certain sort of element of opportunity that you just don't want to leave open for people. This is the same thing. So it might seem strange, but once you learn it, it should make uh, make total sense. And I hope that's uh, I hope that's true today. <clears throat> and you know, you can imagine doing these e-transfers like here on the screen that you see. Uh, it can get not risky, but it can get sort of high stakes because you can send up to three thousand dollars at once. Uh, I know I pay my rent using an e-transfer. So that's a big chunk of money, sort of my biggest single line expense that I send every month just by an e-transfer. And it always works, um, but it's because I always know what I'm doing. So you want to make sure that you know what you're doing. Now, um, I did say I wanted to talk about some of the things that affect online banking safety, but there's one other thing that I just want to, to highlight that because I'm sort of inspired by the bad weather out my window right now, it just makes me think that one of the other things that you can do online, um, I'm just going to stop sharing so you, we can talk and you can see my face when I say this. Um, the other thing that you can do is deposit checks, which is one of those things that is a feature that can save you time. So, for me to get to the nearest bank, it's a 10 minute walk and I don't mind it usually, but I've not always been that close. Sometimes the idea of getting to a bank has been difficult. It's meant lots of traffic. Uh, it's meant a stressful drive. And if I have, a, let's say a check that I got for $46.18, because that's the leftover government credit for some sort of federal rebate program. You've probably all gotten those little checks in the mail, these tiny little things. And sometimes the traffic's so bad or the weather's so bad, I think to myself, do I want to go out and go through all that hassle for $46? Or maybe it's less, maybe it's $13. I don't know. But there's this type of negotiation that happens in your mind that you can solve by simply using a smartphone or a mobile device like an iPad to take a picture of the check and deposit it. So this is remarkably convenient. And I assure you, it is remarkably safe. The one thing that is a bit of a difference is that this is a feature only for mobile devices. So if you are using a laptop or a desktop computer, it won't work in those situations. And that's because it relies on the, the camera and the secure connection of the device in a way that you can't duplicate on a laptop. So um, that's its own separate thing and is probably a great example of something that if you want to learn, give us a Connected Canadians a call and we can help you with that process because it for me has been a big time saver uh, in terms of those tiny little trips to the bank that I don't have to make. Those checks don't have to uh, be worth a drive. So that's just the, the one other thing that I'll add to that list. And now you've heard a lot of what you can do. 
So the next thing that I do want to say, and I want to share a little bit of, is some of the ways that you can stay safe while doing those things. And the first and most important is that you always want to use a different username and password or PIN for each bank and card. <clears throat> so it, if you have accounts with RBC and Scotiabank, don't use the same PIN for both cards. Or for logging onto their websites, don't use the password, the same password for both websites. The username passwords that protect your financial information are going to be the, let's say, juiciest target for any bad actor, any sort of hacker, or malicious person, someone that doesn't have your best interest in mind. And so the problem with using the same password in lots of places is that if one gets compromised, they all get compromised. So that's also why if you like Let's say you have an account on freecrochetpatterns.com uh, because you like to crochet and you go get patterns. You know what? The kinds of, the, the people that make the website freecrochetpatterns.com don't care as much about your security as your bank does. Because, I mean, what are they going to take? The patterns are free anyway. So um, th that makes sense. But when you then use the same username and password for the crochet patterns that you do for all of your money and financial security. I'm sure you can start to see or, or think how the weak link in that chain is the website um, for the patterns. But if it's that, like the chain gets broken because the majority of personal security compromises happen when your information is taken from one place that was easy to get access to, and then it's used to pretend to be you and get into the difficult to access places. So that, that's always why you want to make sure you're using different usernames and passwords for your bank account than anything else. And from bank to bank, each should be different. Now, I know that can be a lot to keep track of, and so the other thing that's always useful is to have a password manager in one of two forms, either a digital one. So that could be something like uh, Trend Micro, Norton McAfee, NordPass, 1Password, LastPass, Google Password, or Keychain for Apple. There's a lot of these out there. And those hide all of your passwords behind one master password. Or you can have what I like to call an analog password manager which is a lot of fancy words for just saying a notebook because <laughs> you just write them all down. Now, if you do that, you want to make sure that your notepad is kept away somewhere safe. So you want it out of view of visitors or cleaners that might be coming into your unit, technicians who might be coming to, to do like repair work. Just keep those passwords somewhere safe and hidden. And... Uh, Another thing that is useful in terms of like financial safety online that is really enabled by online banking or online sort of financial activity is that you can turn on transaction alerts for your credit cards and debit cards. And so if you have a mobile device, like a smartphone or an iPad, you can get these alerts so that if someone processes a payment that you aren't expecting, you can notify the bank immediately. I will admit I had this happen to me just last month. I have a, a joint account with my wife. My wife's card was compromised. And I, because I had my phone on me and saw this first, uh, was able to flag within, I think about 20 minutes of this starting, uh, that my account was being drained by someone that was just taking money little bit by little bit by little bit. We called the bank and because of how strong our case was because we caught this right away, they were able to find where the money was going and get it back. Now, if that's something that you were to wait until the end of the month, when you reconcile your statement against a checkbook, they might have a harder time getting your money back and they might be less sympathetic. Um, they could say, like, well, are you sure you didn't just forget? But something like this, because it happened right away, very much aided in the resolution. 
Um, and another thing to note is that if you're using a device like that smartphone, you do want to keep your device safe as well. So password protect your device, turn on screen locking. And some services will actually have facial or fingerprint recognition to unlock your device rather than a password. That's a very good uh, way to, to use your device. I know that, so I have accounts both with CIBC and TD, and they both allow me to log in using fingerprint authentication. So that's one of those great things that only I have. I also always keep my software up to date. And that's because software updates on both your laptop or smart device, like a cell phone, they allow your security protocols to be as strong and up to date as possible. And the last thing I'll say is you should always think that public Wi-Fi, so, you know, your McDonald's Wi-Fi, stopping at the, like a gas station or something, or being on the, the bus using Wi-Fi there. Those are not places that you should be using your the Wi-Fi to do anything financial because banking applications and websites have excellent encryption standards. So that means that the weak spot of your information be going back and forth is going to be the wireless connection that you're on. So you're at Tim Hortons, they've got free Wi-Fi, but then a hacker sets up a hotspot called Tim underscore Hortons. You connect to that thinking it's the right one, but then everything you send through that hotspot is available to the hacker. So I read the news at Tim Hortons. It's not like I'm fearful of using this kind of Wi-Fi, but I know what I should do and I shouldn't do in those situations. And I will say that the type of information um, that's transmitted just over mobile data, so like not using Wi-Fi, but like cellular data, that's another excellent sort of encrypted way of communicating. So I do trust cellular data. So it's not that I only need to be in my house. I'm fine being out of the house and using cellular data, but uh, Wi-Fi is a no-no for me. And just to... This is sort of true of both phone communications and email and texts and everything like that. So the last thing I want to say before we go over to questions, when it comes to avoiding the kinds of scams that could be trying to access your financial information, banks never ask you for personal or financial information by email. Never. They don't do it. Banks will also never call you and ask you for personal information. Never. They don't do it. And what could fool you is the fact that if you ever call a bank and you say, hey, I, would, I just want to check something in my account, they'll say, okay, great. We just need to ask you a few questions to verify your identity. That happens when you're the one that calls. But if they are calling you, they already have all that info. So anytime you get asked to provide any personal details when you didn't do, make the call yourself, it's always no, never, never say them. And if you get suspicious about something, just hang up and call the number that's on the back of your bank card. That's always the, the best way to sort of verify that the communication is coming from uh, a reputable source. So, you know, thank you, uh, Thank you, whomever's on the phone. I get what you're saying, but I think I'd rather call you back and talk, talk to a representative about this. And um, if so, they're fine. Maybe they'd give you a reference number or something. But if, they're, if they try to keep you on the line, don't trust it. And if you have any questions going forward about any of these kinds of things, we at Connected Canadians are exactly the sort of people that love to help you about this. Um, as far as resources go, there is um, the best thing is actually going to be the the link that we shared in chat earlier. So my colleague Janice just put something that links to uh, a lot of sort of mini guides that go over in greater detail the steps of the things that I was just speaking about. Um, and so with that, we've come to the end of the formal speaking part, because I wanted to give us sort of as much time as possible to go through some questions. And um, I want to thank you all for listening thus far. And just there are a couple um, things that uh, I see in this uh, in the chat window. I'm mostly going to be responding to the Q&A section. 
Um, but someone did just quickly say sort of what are cookies when it comes to things online. Cookies are small pieces of code that remain on your computer in order to help your computer communicate uh, more quickly with a given website. So it like it already answers questions. It lets you know if you visited that site before. Um, so it's just it allows that sort of like back and forth to happen more quickly. But sometimes that does not, uh, sometimes you don't want those cookies to persist. Um, so maybe you want to delete them all. Like if you, not on a banking website, but let's say you're even just logging onto email at a library. And it says this website uses cookies, da, 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 da. You might not want that. So just delete those. Um, so okay. now, uh, just before I start going to questions, Benedict, is there anything else that you wanted to say? No, I was just going to uh, kind of summarize because we have a lot of questions that are kind of uh, echoing each other. A lot of them being about kind of like the bigger question of security, because as I think the first question that was asked was, you know, we've seen a lot of big cyber attacks recently on cities, on mm -hmm. hospitals, on large businesses. So uh, how do you know that what you're doing to your bank, for instance, is actually safe? Or how do you know the last pass is actually safe? Right. Um, so... One of the reasons, um, how would I say this? So everyone knows every time a plane crashes, like anywhere in the world. But it's also true that like an order of magnitude, more people die in like, like from vehicle fatalities, but it's not like, it's not the big thing that gets the attention. Um, and big breaches um, are what get all the attention. But the way in which those big breaches happen are also a little different because big breaches happen because people are big targets. Um, so the, the big things, the reason I use the plane thing is like the one plane crash a year is what shouldn't make you afraid to fly. If anything, you should be more afraid of driving, but most people aren't. And it's the same thing where a lot of times when there's, you know, Bell Mobility or the, this giant corporation has a breach. Should I never go online or use anything? The kind of people that care about those breaches care about that company because there's a billion users. They don't care about your single account in the same way. So the things you have to worry about are usually kind of different. Um, and the big thing you need to care about is different usernames and logins everywhere. If you can get that, like you should feel as safe doing that as you do walking down the sidewalk. And like, yes, a plane could fall out of the sky and hit you, uh, but that's the kind of thing that you also can't prepare for. Now, walking down the street in the middle of the night dressed all in black, that is using the same username and password everywhere. You are setting yourself up in a higher risk situation. Um, so those big breaches shouldn't be what scares you. It's the proper single person security stance that should be what empowers you that's a great analogy i like that um we have some questions regarding particular banks or credit card organizations so like one person says i heard that some credit card organizations and banks uh, or apple pay will notify customers on every big transaction but td seems not to have this feature um is that something that you can speak to that you're aware of um so I can only speak to TD, uh, like, again, because I happen to use TD. <clears throat> and I know that for me, uh, and using TD, there's the basic TD banking app, but there's a second one that provides me um, sort of budgeting tips and spending insights and tracks patterns that's called TD My Spend. Um, and for, I believe that My Spend is actually where you get the most accurate, like those, so they're called push notifications, the things that like bing pop up every single transaction that goes through. Um, so I have it set up so that my spend is what shows me those things. And I, I didn't want to try to cover that here in the, the workshop because it's not true. Like I think BMO, <clears throat> what? Oh, sorry. Um, I think BMO has like one centralized app but 
not every bank does like CIBC does, but I think Scotiabank has too. So there's a little inconsistency there that I want, that I encourage any of you to look into. <clears throat> but the, the Apple one in terms of like Apple pay transactions would be sort of, well, it would be a Apple pay specific, not bank specific. So you could have Apple pay linked to a Scotiabank credit card and to a PayPal account and to a CIBC checking account but that'll all come up as Apple Pay spending alerts. Mm -hmm. So that, that that could be a little different because of that. Okay. And we have actually two questions that are coming back in the chat box and in the Q&A, but that's about BMO and kind of in the bigger picture, BMO seems to be, has announced that they would start char charging a fee for e-transfers very soon. Mm -hmm. And a user is saying they've just started using this wonderful service and it's kind of upsetting to now have to be charged for this. Do you know if this is something that is going to happen now across all banks, or is this just a one bank situation? Um, I only know that uh, as a one bank situation. <clears throat> and my concern would be not that they're eliminating it fully, and but that they're eliminating with <clears throat> they're eliminating the free aspect in certain categories of bank accounts. So it might be that, like, let's say you've got a special seniors account where, you know, your monthly account fee is only six ninety nine, dollars um, And they're telling you that for that, you now are going to start paying fees. But maybe for the standard unlimiting checking account, where it will cost you $15 a month, it's free there. Um, so that's just one of those things where I know that in the past they have... Uh, different banks at different times have played around with the kinds of features provided by every type of account. Um, but in general, your standard checking account has free transfers. If you have a special account that's like that gives you a discounted rate, they may remove features from those discounted ones. Um, so it could be a matter of that. Janice, you want to make a comment? Sorry, can I just interject for a sec? I don't know if, if the viewers know about this, but as a senior, if I'm able to maintain a special senior account with a minimal balance of $5,000, then all transaction fees are waived on my other accounts. So it's just a savings one. I only keep that 5,000 in, but because I have that account and I maintain the minimum balance, I don't have to pay any fees on any of my checking accounts. So ah. that is the TD. Again, I don't know if it's yeah. all the banks. So even though the money sits in savings, it makes the checking account free. That's right. great. And, and I don't yeah. touch it. It just sits there as this little nest egg for some time. As long as that's maintained, <laughs> then there's no, uh, no fees on anything else. So something maybe if people aren't aware of it, at least a TD and they could check if it's true at other banks as well. Thank yeah. you. Um, we have Sima who's asking, where do uh, uh, alerts that advise you that some of your data or that your account has been compromised come from? And will changing that particular account's password be adequate and be enough to protect the account and the data and the money in the future? Um, generally, yes. And what I'm going to do, so if, if there is ever a breach that occurs within... Um, like of your data uh, that the bank becomes aware of, they would contact you directly. Uh, in my case, because the they have, like I was, let's say, infiltrated so well, like they were able to, the, the fraud was more sophisticated and that the bank didn't know that they were taking my money. Um, so even I still don't quite know how they got into things because it was my wife's card. Um, but when it comes to accounts that could have been compromised, I just put, uh, oh, of course, I, I sent a message just to the other panelists. I'm going to send this to everyone. So there's a website called Have I Been Pwned? Have I? And it looks like a typo. You think, oh, he must have meant to put an O there. No, this is right. Have I Been Pwned is the largest public repository uh, that records uh, data breaches. So stick your email address in there and stick all your email addresses in there. If you show up in a data breach 
and you use the password that is a part of that breach on another account, like consider that every account that uses that same password is compromised. And so if any of you, if your bank account is most likely not on this, but maybe it is like your Bell Mobility and you use the same password for Bell Mobility as your banking, that's a danger thing that you should uh, change. So have I been pwned is the best place to track those um, breaches, Any anything, not just a bank. Great. And maybe one more question and then we'll close it for today because it's almost the end of the hour. Uh, with the use yeah. of so many different passwords for future online banking, et cetera, is it safe to have them saved right online? I think that's that's really a sticking point for some people. Yeah. Um, it's at, I guess I'd say it's as safe as it can be. Um, I'm all, uh, so th th there's, I'm aware at this point in time that anything I say like has an additional sort of weight of authority. Uh, and I can only say that I use a password manager and I am comfortable with them. I know that a breach of a password manager is not, it's not out of the question. Um, but I'm comfortable enough with, you know, the belief that lightning doesn't strike twice, um, that I have never had this happen to me. There has been that I know of and that the world knows of sort of only one password manager breach within the last, um, within the last five years. I think it was uh, is BitLocker or BitDefender. There's this one bigger one that had a, a major breach and that that happened um but it's also true sometimes that like banks get robbed electrical fires burn down homes like there are these like incredible like unmitigated disasters that can affect people or organizations um and so there's always a question of negotiating how you feel about overall safety versus security uh versus convenience usability and every person has to negotiate this for themselves. But I will say that password managers in general have a very, very strong track record of keeping your information safe. Right, that is a very reassuring answer because I was thinking that too, as a, as a user of LastPass. Okay, I know you I... want to wrap up, Manajeki, yeah. but there was one question that I think that would be a short. Somebody uh, had asked about getting late payment charges when they're doing online bill payments. And I'm just wondering if that person is aware that if you do a payment on a weekend, often it say the transaction won't occur until the next business day. And possibly that might be why they're getting late payment charges. I, so I just thought I wanted to throw that in the, just to check. Yeah. It will say at the top when that's that transaction is actually going to occur. Yeah, and I've had some of the indicate after you make the payment, it'll tell you it'll take two to three days to process. Yeah, so it's exactly. after you've actually made the payment that you don't know it's going to take that long. So that, that does occur. I, I know personally, yeah. we also get every transaction, we get emails in our email box. So just as a security. So if it's a joint account, then if the partner is spending, then at least we know what's being going on. Um, so if something yeah. suspicious, we can sort of track it that way. If you're looking at emails, which we, I know we do every day, but um, that's another way of just checking to make sure like you, Jesse, if you're a compromised card, it's kind of like, uh Oh, like, <laughs> who's spending, um, who's spending what. So that's just another security yeah. thing that we have. There's lots of questions. Unfortunately, we can't get to all of them. And we do appreciate um, that. If there's other questions that kind of come up that um, we can ask Jesse offline and we could post, uh, if there's a link or something that's affiliated with that, we can put that on the website after the webinar as well. So thank you all for your great um, uh, questions today. That uh, was excellent in having these conversations because as we know, cybersecurity is one of those things that, uh, unfortunately, we have to become more and more aware of as um, as uh, scammers and everybody's out there to try and take advantage of our funding. I would like to inform everybody about another uh, few webinars that we have coming up. Uh, again, we're collaborating with uh, the Canadian Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse and many other partners to host uh, a webinar next week on getting serious about the human rights of older persons on our call for a UN convention. And 
this is really important because we don't have one uh, convention. We don't have a declaration for the rights of older persons. And we're really working forward or working towards having that and having people engaged in advocating for that. And people will learn how to, uh, what they can do to play a role in that. Um, we have uh, the Honorable um, Adrian Clarkson, who's going to be joining us. Um, the Minister for Seniors and uh, many other guests from the UN and other global um, organizations that will be speakers. So please check that out and uh, join us for that webinar. And working again with uh, CNPA hosting two sessions, uh, they're leading uh, the, the role in developing a toolkit on the development of elder abuse uh, networks. There's a toolkit that's come out. So on the 16th and 17th, we'll be doing webinars uh, with them just promoting that uh, and letting people know what this toolkit's about. So please look on our websites, uh, either CNPA or EAPO to look um, for that information. And we'll be sharing this, the links also for these sessions that you can register for. And the big World Elder Abuse Awareness Day is coming up. Um, it is June 15th, the actual day, but we're hosting a national forum um, on June 12th, so you can pre-register for that. Last year, we had over 800 people registered for that event. Um, there'll be details coming soon, but we just want people to know that uh, you can register ahead of time. Uh, again, all this information is uh, available for you on our websites. And just a reminder, as Benedict indicated, the evaluation, you'll get a pop-up uh, to spend, it's one to two minutes of just clicking uh, check boxes about your learning today. And uh, if there's other topics that you might wanna learn about in regards to uh, protecting your finances, as we've been talking about today, um, or other topics, please let us know, because we try to uh, work towards meeting your needs of and learning what you want to know more about. And if you want to get in touch with either one of our organizations, our contact information is posted here. Um, again, you can check out our uh, websites for other resources and information um, that you might be interested in, in terms of protecting your finances or other information around prevention of elder abuse. So thank you all again for um, joining us and for our, again, to our ASL interpreters um, who did a great job. And um, and thank you both uh, Janice and Jesse for your great presentation today, and a Benedict of course. So thank you, and uh, we'll see you uh, next week for all the other webinars that we're having. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye.